natural length of, of the field, natural length. Of the screen. Now, what you do is you write Newton's law of motion. Newton's law basically says the in, in very generally says the rate of change of momentum is given by sum of forces. This is the most general version of Newton's law. The rate of change, mv is the momentum, as you recall. The rate of change of the momentum of a moving body is given by the sum of forces, by the, dis by the disequilibrium of the forces. Now, this is, of course, mass, and this is velocity, right? Now, if you assume m is uh, constant, you, the first thing you do is you take m out and you get, now you, you get a simpler equation. You get a simpler version of it, which sounds more familiar, by more practically used. m dv over dt equals sum of forces. Or you recall, you know, m d squared x over dt squared, right? Equals sum of forces. Now, this is the famous f equals ma, you recall? All right, so we don't write F equals MA, of course, in system dynamics. You rather follow the actual causal law that Newton developed, which says the acceleration times mass is caused by what? Or the rate of change of momentum is caused by the net sum of forces acting of the, on the body. All right? This causes this. So that's why... You know, for many years I didn't quite understand the causal meaning of this. I had to see this version later in the university. You know, at, at high school we saw it like this. Later at university, perhaps even at that, I don't know to call that. Then I, when I saw it this way, I understood that this was a causal statement, a causal law. It says there are a bunch of forces acting on a body, and if the forces are not in equilibrium, then it causes a what? An acceleration. Well, so anyway, if you continue now, what are the forces acting on this body? As you recall, the, the way you do that in, in in this mechanical systems modeling. So the forces are one is potential external force, any potential external force. Force. There may be an external force f of t, which I am just leaving it as f of t, this one, right? Now, and then two, there are internal forces. The famous internal force of this system is what? The force exerted by the spring, right? That's the most famous force. Because if you push the spring, the spring pushes back. If you pull the spring, the spring pulls back. That's called the spring force. That spring force, that's the famous spring force that you already know by experience or by, uh, by our physics knowledge. Now, so, but a force exerted by the spring, by the spring, the spring force, we call it F of F sub S, now, now then, well, in general, we know that what? If x is zero, spring force is positive. Well, I'm sorry, if x is negative, spring force is what? Positive. Because it pushes back, right? So if x is negative, then spring force is what? Positive. If x is positive, then spring force is what? If x is zero, what's the spring force? What does it correspond to? It corresponds to natural, the way we define the x0 is the natural length of the spring. So if x0, as you say, spring force is 0, because it's at rest by definition. It's neither elongated nor squeezed, right? Well, this one, the first level of knowledge. The second level of knowledge, then, how does it look as a function 
This is f of s, this is h then. So we know that as it passes this function, goes through 0. And then this says what? If it's linear, it would be like this. Do you agree? If it's not linear, it would be perhaps something like this or something like this. Well, so we are not going to discuss this. We are not doing a realistic mechanical systems model in here. So this is what we know. And we also know, this is quite easy to prove it and demonstrate it in experiment. For small displacements, it's linear. All right? When you don't pull it too much or squeeze it too much for reasonable uh, movements, small movements, it's pretty well known that it's linear. That's known. The, the thing that you may discuss is this portion. Will it go like this? Or maybe will it go like this? Or will it go like this? Or maybe will it go like this? OK? These portions, we don't quite know. But we are not going to discuss it now anyway. So we will assume that we are discussing small moments and it's linear spring force. We don't have time to discuss it. This, this will be an interesting thing to discuss in IE 550 model in a modeling course nonlinear functions. Okay. So if you assume linearity, so we, in general we, you, you assume that this is the, the linear spring force assumption says it's just equal to mu, here I called huh? what? K. Yeah, k and here I use the term mu, so I'm going to mm -hmm. stick with this term mu. So I, I the sum would call this mu. Spring constant mu, so it's that's minus mu h. Mu is the spring constant. Mu is a positive constant, which is called the spring constant. How hard the spring is, how strong it is. The second one is, the second famous force is the medium, resistance of the medium to the motion. Since you, you are not typically in a vacuum, either you, you, know, you can be on a, of course, you know, in air, thick air, thick or thin, whatever, or in, in, in some mud, and there is a lot of what? resistance. So friction or resistance, the two are formulated somewhat differently. Again, we are not going to discuss details of these. But there is some sort of resistance to motion, right? Resist resisting force. Now, so I like to call it resistance and or friction. The two are sometimes formulated differently. Sometimes friction force is assumed to be constant, whereas resistance force, uh, A resistance is proportional to velocity, if you remember. But we are not going to discuss that. We'll just assume that you combine, there is one, one force that basically, roughly speaking, again, just for illustration purposes, <coughs> gets stronger and stronger as the velocity gets larger and larger. So this, the resistance force looks then like this. Uh, then it's very similar to that. This time, if V velocity is positive, then the, what you, you can call resistance force or frictional force uh, uh, is less than zero. If velocity is uh, negative, then Distance force is greater than zero. If velocity is zero, it's not move, move, moving, then the uh, resistance force is zero. All right? So that's, again, that's you know, this A resistance is typically formulated like this. Do you remember? That there is a falling body, you know, the faster you move, the more resistance you, you, you face. So that, if you recall it, there is something called Final velocity. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? You reach a final constant velocity just because of this. Because you know, the negative feedback, right? The negative feedback rate causes you to reach a final. That's why if you throw the cat from the 20th floor, the cat doesn't die because you, know, if you have a particular body shape. Uh, you can very quickly reach a terminal velocity and uh, final velocity constant velocity, so the cat can, and, and that's known, that, that's documented. When the cat jumps from the second floor, may die or may not die, but doesn't change when the cat jumps, they say, from the tenth floor. There's a lot of 
<laughs> stories and sometimes videos I don't see people from chats but that's not quite a nice experiment but there is a lot of evidence yeah. about the cats jumping from the tent floor or whatever it's called the tent and nothing happened. So anyway, uh, th this one, then, th th then this is velocity, this is resist resistance force, and again it's something like this. Again you can, same story, okay, for small velocities, it's linear, you can also, this is more typically assumed to be linear in general, you know, it's, there is not much discussion about linearity of this, but again, you may again, uh, you know, argue that uh, there may be some, some non-linearity there, but I don't want to discuss again, that's beyond our topic. We will assume that the easy introductory models assume, in physics assume that this is minus constant times dx over dt. Dx over dt, of course, is v, right? And then you can have other things which I am not going to discuss. Gravitational force, right? Huh? G. And even other, well, so you can have mg, gravitational force. Yeah. Well, if, if, it's, if it's vertical, then clearly gravitational force becomes very important. If it's like this, it has a different effect, right? It tries to bend it slightly, so it has a kind of a very, very mild effect on the motion. So we are not going to include this. But the reason why I'm writing it down, it can have other effects depending on the shape of this position. So if you forget about this, if you just take these two main forces that are dominant, dominant the resistance force and the friction, the, the spring force, the model looks like this. Then the model Because what if you plug these in here, right? So you get this m d squared x over d t squared, f, and then plus what? No, not plus. Equal. Not plus. Equals what? And we are just writing this, right? Equal sum of forces. And what are the forces? One of them is, huh? is minus mh, right? And what's the minus this? Do you agree? And then, of course, plus you may have f of t, which is external force, right? So what you have is d squared x over dt squared plus mu over m times x plus this gamma over m dx over dt equals f of t over m. So the bottom line is the model looks like this. d squared x over dt squared. Uh, you put it in order. And I am calling now gamma over m k. I think that's what I call in, in, in this in the in the model that I gave you. This one I am calling K. K times dx over dt. That's just one notation. Plus I'm just keeping with the notation I gave you. This equal call this F. F. Mm -hmm. This is then the typical basic the second order model that that represent the motion of a displacement of a mass attached to a spring. Uh, F is, is some external, I call this F, F divided by M, I can speak with that. This external force, these are a bunch of constants. Mu is, what constant? Mu is spring, spring constant, M is mass, K is the uh, resistance constant divided by M. Yeah? Hocam bu şey, friction force veya resistance force e, hıza bağlı değil de constant force ayrı mı hocam? Well, then this, this, then, then sometimes there, there can be plus k here, sometimes o, like that. O şekilde that. değil mi hocam? Hani just mesela, k. Plus just k, ya yani ama şey, mesela hız pozitif olduğu zaman evet. minus k, negatif olduğu zaman 
plus yeah. gain olan. Evet. Sıfır olduğunda da. Yeah. Then then then you, you have to write the model in two two two two forms. You you say for positive you plus k or minus k. So you have to analyze in two different regions. Yeah. That's that model is typically analyzed. Uh, okay. So, but anyway, so this is the, the, uh, the as I said, the easiest introductory uh, model. Now, what, the, if you try to solve this, you write the root, you find the roots of the right, r square plus k r plus mu over m over m times m equals zero. If you assume that, assume zero first. Why? Because to analyze the homogeneous part, right, of the model. If you assume zero first, the homogeneous solution will be determined by the root. So the behavior, of course, is completely, almost completely determined by this discriminant. Um, we say if, if, if, let me do it here. If k squared is greater than 4 mu over m, then what do we have? Real distinct root, right? <coughs> and what kind of number is this? Two re two distinct two real roots, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of number is this? Is this number greater or less than this? Less, less than. Huh? Less. Is it less? In absolute. Yeah. In, in, in, in, in magnitude less. Mm -hmm. So that means that this is a two negative root. Because either you are adding two negative numbers or a negative number and a smaller positive number. Mm -hmm. So you get two negative roots. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to discuss it, I'm just telling you, alright? So you get a stable what? Dynamics, which if you analyze, this is a non-interesting string case. If we get two what? If this is greater than this, which means, relatively speaking, you have a very strong what? What what does K show? K is this. Mm -hmm. You have a very strong resistance to motion. You get two real negative roots, which means you are not going to get an oscillation, right? You get an immediate damping system going to an equilibrium. You can you visualize this? You pull it, and then it goes like this. Okay, it doesn't oscillate at all. All right. So the physical interpretation is because K is so, so big that is the resistance is so strong that it doesn't, it doesn't oscillate. So you can physically interpret that. That's not very often seen, right? Which is non-oscillatory. Non-oscillatory. Stay. Two is what? If K squared is less than 4 mu m. Equal is not interesting. Equal, you get double roots, and still you get a stable. Equal is similar to this, okay? If k squared equals for m, you get something similar to this. Again, you get a stable, non-oscillatory motion. But if you get less than, I mean, you can write the solution. The solution in this case would be what? In this case, you can. What's the solution? It is y of x, x of t equals what? A e to the r, r1 t plus b e to the r2 t, where r1 and r2 are two negative numbers. You see? So it's a very, very trivial solution, okay? Very simple solution. Real solution. A e to the r1 t plus b e to the r2 t. Uh, I divided this in two parts, right? But why did I do that? Because I know that this is not a real number anymore, right? That's why I divided it two. So that this is the real part, 
and this would be what? The imaginary part. So now it looks like this equals minus q over 2 plus or minus, I call it i omega, where omega is what? Omega is, you agree with this one, 4 mu over m minus k squared divided by k. In other words, omega is the, is the magnitude, magnitude of that. All right? This is the square root of minus 1 is here. So omega is the number, the magnitude. OK? Do you agree? So this is, the, this is the root. Then you can write down. Then the solution is what? A sort of t equals, going back to the to this general solution that we had, what do you write? you remember? e to the what? e to the minus k over 2 t. Parenthesis, cos uh, we had a and b something. Did you call it c and d or a and d? Mm -hmm. c times what? Cosine omega t. So omega is here, right? Omega t plus e sine d sine omega t, right? Then this is the solution. So the reason why you call W here, because W is that, you remember that W is a symbol for frequency and we choose this on purpose. So as it turns out, you should see a little result here, the complex part, I'm sorry, the imaginary part of the complex roots become what? The frequencies of the oscillations. So you can direct delete that, you can see the frequency of the oscillation is what? Is the complex, imaginary part of the complex root. <coughs> and one over the frequency will be what? The period of the oscillation. So you can also find the period. So uh, the reason why I'm doing this quick overview here, so that, so that you can attach meaning to this question, so that you don't do it as a dummy, meaningless number fraction our algebra. Okay? So th all these coefficients have these meanings. So when you do this, you attach meaning to these things. So that you understand when k is greater, it means something. When, when mu is large, it means something. You know, you did a lot of causal modeling in IE5. So it means something, okay? So that the results must make causally sense. When k is great, large, what does it mean? When mu is large, what does it mean? Right? When mu is small compared to m, what does it mean? Or when when gamma is large or small compared to m, what does it mean? These are important uh, meanings. And, and the results must intuitively make sense. So you do all this analysis. And the very last question, that, so this is the third question, part A says, uh, analyze the homogeneous part. So in part A, what do you do? You just do this. You just complete what I said here. It's very simple. In part B, uh, there is an external force exponentially decaying that is a kind of a damping exponential force. And, and then you are given initial conditions x0 and x dot 0. Yeah, x0 and x dot 0. There's no mistake there. So you are given two initial conditions. And you are asked to find the complete solution. That means what you are supposed to do, that what I didn't do here, was what? To evaluate what? C and D. So what you are supposed to do is, you are supposed to find the what? homogeneous solution, leave it like that, plus find what? The particular solution that comes from what? e to the minus t. Add the two, get a complete solution, take the complete solution, in the equation then plug what? x0 equate x dot 0, take the derivative, equate to the given b, evaluate c and d. There is, there is, there is a reasonable amount of what? Algebra. Actually. And that's what I want you to do. Okay? So you can brush up your derivatives and algebra. Okay? So that's, that's about this, this assignment. And that's, that's, a, that's enough in terms of our coverage review of 
introduction to linear dynamical uh, systems, differential equations. This is all this thing you already knew. And at this point, I'm assuming that you know this. At this point, as of today, the assumption is that you know how to solve first order differential equations, all differential equations. And you know how to solve linear second order constant coefficient differential equations. You are not supposed to know more than this. You are supposed to know all of this. <laughs> okay? Linear constant coefficient second order differential equations. So when you do this, get your differential equation. So, all right, now, what we are going to do now, now we'll start talking about nth order linear differential equations, which in general you may not have seen in differential equations. In general, general nth order linear dynamical systems. We'll quickly do an introduction to that later next week, and then we'll start talking about nonlinear systems, what difference there are. What are the problems and what can we do about it? But before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about uh, simulation, the notion of simulation and the numerical method. Simulation as a numerical solution method. You see, there are two ways of interpreting simulation. This is a little new, a small new heading. There are two ways of interpreting simulation. One is taking a dynamical model <coughs> and kind of imitating, having a dynamical model imitate a real life problem and then do this sort of imitation acting on the real life problem in the computer. That's one way of explaining simulation. Have a model imitate, approximate and imitate some dynamic real life operation, right? That's one way of explaining simulation to a non-technical person. But there is another explanation of definition of simulation in the context of specifically differential equations, dynamical models, and that is simulations are also numerical solution procedures Numerical, numerical approximations to solving differential equations. So that's another way of seeing simulation. Now, let me just do something like this. Just consider dy over dt a uh, first order differential equation as a first introductory example. And y of t0 is given as y0. All right? Let's consider this. And in general, this is not linear. There is no reason why it should be linear. It's a general first order. Yeah. Now, for some reason, assume you cannot solve this. All right? You know what the solution is. The solution is what? Solution would be what? If I knew the solution, solution would be, if I could obtain the solution, it would be some explicit function of time that satisfies this, right? And we have seen examples. Say I cannot, if, assume I cannot solve this, I want to approximate, I am unable to, to obtain y of t analytically. So I approximate so I approximate by y of t1, y at point t1, I call it approximately is equal to y1. So I don't know, I approximate it point by point. y, the true value of y t2 is approximated by y2 and true value of y uh, tn is approximated by yn uh, on on t between some a and b. 
So this picture looks like this. This is t, this is y of t. And as a quick example, let us say y of t was this. This is y of t. So I don't know this. Instead, this is y0, y t0. And in general, I assume t0 is 0 from this point on. You know, that loss of generality can always call t0 zero, 0. This is y t0, right? This point. That's given. Now, t1, let us say, is here. t1, t2, t3, t3. t3. t3. t3. Uh, And, and you can also assume that A is A in this picture. A is T0, right? So this is A. And this is what? Tn is what? B. Right? T0 is A in this notation. I'm interested in this one. Right? So what happens is, you, this is the true value, right? And instead, <coughs> initially they are the same. Instead, you find some approximation, <coughs> can I, can you find, which is maybe here, very close. You, can you find some approximation to FT2, which is somewhere here, very close. All right? Now, if they are all close enough, right, you are satisfied. So this goes like this. Right? Right? This looks satisfactory, right? If you look at these points, the and you connect them with imaginary lines, linear lines, or nonlinear lines. The dynamics indicated by this, the point is very similar to, very close to the true dynamics. In a, in a bad situation, you may get something like this, which is now, again what? A growth curve, but has huge errors, visually at least, right? Compared to the true. So, in one case, you see a good approximation, in the other case, you see a bad approximation. But nevertheless, they are all one approximation. Does that mean that the all approximation results are below the normal? Well, the actual line? No, in, in, but in, in you don't explain random. Yeah, if you, if you, if you, use, a, if you use an introductory basic, uh, not very sophisticated, standard, numerical approximation procedure, and if you have an exponentially growing pattern, typically this is what you expect. So I just did that because, because that's the realistic expectation, because you are lagging behind it, you know. Uh, but there are some sophisticated techniques in which you may even find yourself sometimes above, sometimes below, while you're doing some, you know, guessing ahead, so, so, so. But, you know, but, Typically, this is what the expectation. But if you have a sine wave, it would not be like this, right? Mm -hmm. You see, in the sine wave, you sometimes be above, sometimes below, because of that lagging behind. That is just a visual, visual explanation. So this is the idea, all right? So let's, <coughs> let's now uh, immediately start seeing examples. The question is how, how? How to obtain what? Y1, Y2, Yn. This is the question. That's all. How do you obtain Y1 and Y2 dot, dot, dot, dot Yn? How can you assure that these are close enough to Yt1, Yt2, Ytn true values? This field is called the numerical solution of differential equations. Okay? analysis of the method solution of the energy. So method, yeah. one, the most, the most important and simplest method, 
fundamentals, the basic, what everything is done. The basic uh, introductory method is called Euler. Ten times you see Euler, right? Everywhere, Euler is everywhere. Euler's method. Now, Euler's method is uh, well. That's something you already know in a nutshell. Uh, just recall this. Uh, recall. This is just a little parenthesis. Recall this. Recall that in some simulation software like Stella, this equation is presented like this. Uh, y t plus dt minus yt equals dt Well, okay. You call first this one, then you recall this. You call this yt plus dt equals yt plus dt times sum of flow. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. This is, first you call this from some, any simulation software like Stellar. Mm -hmm. That's how it works, right? That's kind of the basic definition of what stock is, right? Previous value plus dt times sum of flow. Sum of flow is nothing but what? The net rate of change, which is what? F. There's nothing but F in our notation. But this is net rate of change of that very one time. Huh? Yeah. Exactly. Which is given as some function specification. So, so now go back. Then this one is equal to what? This implies that. This implies this. Because from my 550 to the set of T Y. All right. In other words, the, the two are the same. If you approximate, you can call this as an approximation. Do you agree? This is an approximation to this. Do you agree? Because if you take the limit of this as dt goes to zero, you get this. If you don't take the limit, it becomes an approximation for a small dt. So this clearly says that this is an approximation to this. That means, remember the idea? You can use this to find approximate, approximate solution. And that's called Euler's method. Okay. So, so this is then, so it looks like this. You can call that Euler's method for so starting plus uh, on an interval uh, zero to b. Forget about a now. This a, let's just assume that a is zero because always we can assume that a is one. Zero. So an interval zero to b starts with with y zero. That's given, right? Y zero equals what? Y of zero. And choose choose the what? Choose small d t. And now we we'll call that h. That step size is called h in numeric uh, analysis, numeric solution jargon. So choose a step size h. H is such that it divides b into what? The interval b into what? N small, n, n many what? Uh, n small, small, n many intervals, so that in general you assume that n is greater than b. Significant we will assume that. If it's not greater than b, then you may have, you can still do it, but you have some complication. But in general, we assume that, assume, and greater than b, much greater than b, which means that h is, so is what? Less than one. one. So that's, that's a typical assumption. So we assume that so h is less than one. So you do all that assumption, and then it looks like this. Y, here is the loop term, y t plus h equals what? Uh, 
includes y t plus h times f of what? t plus, I'm sorry, comma, y. Now let's, let's now put some symbolism here, proper symbol. There is no notion of T anymore, there is another TI. Do you agree? Because there is T1, T2, T3. You see the new symbol? Mm -hmm. There is Y1, Y2, Y3, and there is what? T1, T2, T3. So now you see, uh, you can assume that T is initially what? Zero. Right? H is given, H is a number. And then next what do you say? T equals T plus what? Do you agree? That's the next thing, right? So do you complete now? Is it workable? Okay. And here, this Y should be what? At any point in time. So the first time around, let's now see. It's what? When T is zero, you get what? For instance, let us say H is point one, you get Y at point one equals what? Y0 plus point 0.1 times F T is what? T0. Zero. Mm -hmm. zero. Y and what's Y? Y0. Y0. Y0. Now that one, you should use this notation, uh, else you should use Y, you know, here you should use the notation of Y, Y sub T plus H. So that you use a subscript there. Otherwise, you should put in parentheses what? Y sub T. Do you understand? Because y is not defined. So let me just say y, sub, y of t here. Later we will use substitute. We will use y sub t. But here I'm using y of t. All right? In other words, this is defined. This is y0. Because we cannot use y, y 0.1 here. We will find it yet. This is y0. This is what? 0. Do you understand? And it works. Next time around, this becomes what? T becomes. Point 0.1, so this becomes y at 0 0.2, blah, blah, blah. so there's a loop here. Until what? Until t becomes what? B. B. At which point you find all these points. So this is the idea, all right? There is a loop that takes step by step, starting with y0, finds what? Y1, Y2, Y3, which has Y1, Y2, Y3 are really what? Y at 0, Y at H, Y at 2H, Y at 3H, Y at NH. All right, so this is non-technical derivation of Euler's method. By non-technical, I mean it's derived from the approximate definition of derivative. Do you see? If you, if you look at this, the way I derived it by a non-technical, just like an approximate definition of the derivative. It's technical, I shouldn't call it not technical, but it's a, it's a different derivation. The way it was derived more formally in mathematics, another derivation, another formal and general derivation, formal and general derivation, is based on based on Taylor C using Taylor C. Taylor C. You know, Taylor series is very general, very powerful way of approximating functions. So Taylor series uh, O four for let us say Y ti plus 1, next y, around point ti. Let's write this down and then it makes sense. It looks like this. y at point ti plus 1, next t, so to speak. Now I'm using this exactly this chart. Okay? y, 1, y, 2, so forth. Y at ti plus 1 equals the previous y plus, if you know the previous y, 
Taylor series says what? Take all the derivatives, by using all the derivatives, this is infinite many number of derivatives, you can find any what? You can, you can approximate what? Any function, right? If you know the previous value, by finding some combination of what? All the derivatives, you can find the new value of that function. So that's a very interesting infinite term representation of any function. If you have derivatives. So this says that ti plus 1 minus ti times what? First derivative of <coughs> the known point, the known function. Right? And then what do you do? Plus 1. Ti plus 1 minus ti squared over what? Over actually two factorial. Yeah, you're right. Times what? Double prime. Second derivative of this. And then plus, it will be, now you remember, you know better than I do. This, the third power divided by three factorial, right? Times the third derivative of y. <coughs> okay? <coughs> so it was like this. Okay? It's an infinite. To be exact, exact equality requires what? Infinite sum. Of course, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to write an infinite sum, but rather we try to it and the most easy, simplest first order approximation says what? Throw all the nonlinear terms and you have left this with this. If you throw everything, we only get this. So the simplest approximation, crudest approximation, or simplest approximation, is the following. That's that's this. All right. So I write like this: y ti plus one equals yti, that's right, plus yeah. And more interestingly, of course, it has a special form, yti plus h, and y prime is what? y prime at ti is nothing but what? f ti, right? So then we have what f times f of I'm not f times f not times f of ti comma y ti. So this is the famous then. This is the name. It's called. Uh, Euler's approximation, Euler's solution of a differential equation based on first order Taylor approximation. This is derived from Taylor's. And you get the same result. The two are the same, right? Alright. So how does it work? Well, again, it's clear. The way it works is sometimes sometimes now you write it like this, using this notation finally, the numeric notation. You write this y i plus one. You can forget about these ti's, right? There is no notion of t anymore. There is the notion of step. Y i plus one equals y i. That sometimes people present it like this: h times f what of ti comma y i, where ti is equal to what simply? You may need ti here if you have an explicit function of time in the, fun in the function, an external function. Ti is defined what? as what? Huh? Just uh, i times h. Right? It's simply what? 1h, 0h, 1h, 2h, 3h, so All right. Uh, if you need it an explicit here. And you do this in a loop, 
it's just like, you know, I'm not going to rewrite this. You start with what? Y0 given, right? Mm -hmm. And it works. Do you agree? Because the function is given. So the function is given. Uh, let's just see why it works here. You know, you know that it works. We can see a ridiculously small example. Uh, dy over dt equals minus y plus t plus 1. Well, and y 0 equals 1. Solve this. Now, you can solve this analytically, right? But the point here to illustrate, and more nicely also, if you can solve, you can evaluate the errors. Right? So you can do that as a little exercise. I have just started. The implementation looks like this. y 0 equals 1. Ti equals, as I said, i times h. Y i plus 1 equals y i plus h times, what am I going to write here? y i plus, huh? plus Ti one. plus 1. All right. So initially y0 is known, right? The, and the loop starts with, the loop runs with i equals 1 to what? Uh, 0 to 0, 1, 2, all the way to n, right? So what do you get? You get, uh, you know, initially y0 is given, you can find y1, right? y0 is given, and t0 is given, so forth. And then next time around, we can find y2, because you have y1, and you have y1 here, and you have t1 is nothing but h, so forth. All right? So it works. So when you do this, you know, you, you can get it. You can get... Uh, I equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You go like this, and then you get yi. It's 1. Then you compute. I think next time around, you still get 1. That's cool. And getting 4 digits. And then you get 1.010. 1, 0, 1, 0. Well, I don't have enough numbers here. I don't too many computations. Huh? Yes, I don't want to minus y again, no? Sure. Ah, minus y again. Computation that minus L much more. I don't want to equilibrium model. Equilibrium model is the issue. Equilibrium model? Yes. Sıfır. B ye bölde et sıfırla başlıyor. Y ye plus y. Nasıl oluyor? Y ye eşit. Bir dakika bir hesaplayalım bakalım. Bir. T ilk başa sıfır. Y1 eşittir. Y1 neye eşit? Y1, şu, sen şu biri buluyorsun. Şu biri. Dedim doğru. Y1 onlar homojeniz. Sen çünkü. Homojeniz olsa akli mi? Y1, sen şu biri buldun, doğru. Y1 eşittir. Şey çıkıyor. Y0 çıkıyor. Dedi. Doğru, tesadüf falan başlıyor. Tesadüf o. Ama Y2, Y1, Y1 eşit çıkamaz çünkü. Şu, şu. Evet. Bu ne işte. Işte. Ondan sonra da bozuluyor zaten. Yani önemsiz bir model. Çünkü model değil de. Bu şey, nanobojiyiz. Model örneği olarak verdim. Bunu çıkıyor. Yani just made this up. Bunun sebebi şey. Yanında bir de gerçek y, ty'yi bulabilirsiniz. Çözüm. Bu, bu, şurası aynı ilk ikisi. Bunlar tam doğru buluyor ilk 
Yok. Yok. Yok. Bu, bu, bu, bu, bunun burada bir sıfır sıfır mazı diye bir şart yok burada. Yok. Burada tam bir bakan diye bir şey koyuyor. Sıfır çıkar. O arada bir sürü bir. İnfinite sıfır hesap yaptı için kurtuluyor. Burada başka bir değer çıkıyor tam bakın. Bu örnek o açıdan da gelmiş gibi. Aynen çıkmıyor mesela. Bu anda bir değer. Burada bir sıfır sıfır dört olmuş. Çözümü T artı E üzeri eksi T bulmuşum ben bunu çözüyorum. Sevdim ben bunu çözdüm bak. O yaptı işte T artı E üzeri eksi T. Neyse ya bu, bu örneği sadece şunu vermek için yaptım. Bir de <gülüyor> burada doğruysa yaptıklarım şey de kompüt edebilirsin. İşte Errerin nasıl değiştiğini çizerek falan bakabilirsin. Okey. Uh, well, the continuing with simple Euler <coughs> method. Uh, in Euler method or in other numerical analysis numerical solution method. There is this general area of analysis called error analysis. Analysis of the error. So first you know that you are what? Uh, committing errors doing this approximation because you are truncating terms. But then you turn around and you try to estimate your own error. You say, what order of magnitude of error am I uh, causing by this approximation? So let's just have a little parenthesis, say error analysis. And specifically we apply to Euler's method. Well, there are in general two components of the error. One is the major component, the other is minor component. Two components of error, two sources of error. One is called truncate, what is called truncation error. In Taylor. Error due to truncation of the Taylor series. That I know that, right? I mean, there's not a random error or unexpected error or surprise error. I'm truncating. I know that in theory, if I have an infinite Taylor series, infinite sum, then I would get a precise computation of the true one, y value, right? I'm truncating it, so I know I'm going to have errors. So that's called truncation. Error due to truncation. Now, uh, there is a formula that estimates the order of the order of magnitude, not the precise value, but order of magnitude of the error. That is, to what, what is it proportional to? The order of magnitude of the errors as a result of every step of Taylor series truncation. If you take a look at this, <coughs> this is h squared, right? You know, this term has h squared in it. The following term will have h cubed in it. Then term after that will have h to the four in it. You there is a there is a formula to analyze uh, uh, the error. The, the, the approximate order of magnitude of the truncation error in uh, Taylor series truncation, it says at each step, and this it also makes common sense when I write it down. At each step, and I skip the details of this formula. At each step, 
the truncation, the truncation error is uh, all of order of this is the order of or order of magnitude order of h square in Taylor series. There is a there is a long formula. I am not going to discuss the formula. We are not interested in that. Uh, the formula that says that the truncation estimation, the formula is dominated by this term. The other terms are too small. H square, H cube, H to the fourth are so small. We are assuming, remember, uh, this analysis becomes easier when you assume a small enough H value. So the, the dominating term, the order of magnitude of the truncation error is uh, dominated by H square, a number like H square is proportional to H square order of magnitude h square. So uh, that uh, in each step, every time you truncate, the, the, the, the, the numbers that you are omitting is all h square. But at, at the end, the accumulated error, since we have, <coughs> we apply it at n equals d over h times, you, know, you apply successively, what? b over h times, right? n equals b over h, if you look at from here, b over h times. So if you say, you know, b over h times this, which will be then, all the order of magnitude will be then h, o of h. Is the cumulative, is the accumulated truncation error. Truncation error. Alright. So that's one famous conclusion. This is the famous saying. We say the order of magnitude or the truncation error, cumulative truncation error, in, at the end of, uh, by applying Euler's method, is O of H proportional to h, and at each step it's proportional to h squared. This is kind of the famous result for error analysis of Euler approximation. Error'ın büyüklüğünün büyüme ordunu gösteriyor değil mi? Yani bu kadar error değil mi? Uh, well, it's proportional means the, the, if you want to control the error, h. it will grow proportionately with h, and it will shrink proportionately with h. If you want to control. You can also have an idea about the magnitude of the error, of course, then. Because if you are using different methods, one of them is O of H, the other one is O of H squared, you know that, proportionally speaking, you will have less error in proportion to H in one case than compared to the other. You can also compare different methods. If another method has the cumulative truncation error of O of H cubed, then you can in general say that the cumulative error at the end will be smaller in that method compared to Euler's method. But as, I, as you say, for a given method, you analyze it to see that how can I increase or decrease the error. The answer is it's, it will be decrease or increase will be proportional to, to, to h uh, at the end. H, h kare göre bu daha kötü değil mi? Evet. Now, <coughs> there is another component of the error, which is nowadays rarely seen. Uh, let me just continue here. Uh, let me, uh, so this was one, right? Two is a rarer error, a kind of a rarely analyzed error these days. It used to be analyzed more in the older days, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Who is round, computer round of error? That is, what I mean, computer truncation, not Taylor truncation. 
Now this is uncontrolled. This is not you do on purpose. If you did it by hand, you wouldn't have this error, right? Mm -hmm. This just comes from the computer limitation. So computer roundup or truncation, not failure truncation. Here's how it goes. <coughs> you know, the computer can only store so many significant digits, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot store uh, in easily in a small computer a number like uh, you know, 5.321689278005.3. You cannot do that. You cannot decide in a, in a, reason, in a, in a, in a, in a typical personal computer you know, 10 or 14 significant digits. That's not possible. Okay. Uh, in, in the older days, you could only store like five, six decimal. I mean, significant decimal points. <coughs> These days, it's better. But in any case, <coughs> after a certain point, you lose the digits, right? Now, what does it mean? Well, the problem is that if you are dealing with very small numbers. It becomes a problem. Do you agree? Because if the numbers are, we get practical example, if the numbers that you deal with are 0 0.0000798, 0 0.0000795, and if you if you lose 95 and 98, the two numbers are the same. They are both 0 0.00007, right? So you can clearly see that if you are dealing with very small numbers in the computer, then you are in effect losing significant digits. Why am I saying this? I'm saying because this suggests that, <coughs> right side down, therefore, the smaller age, the better. Do you agree? That that's the general true, but except that if you go to the extreme, you should start thinking about this. If your numbers are small, the numbers that you deal with are small, they are not huge numbers like millions, and your age is very small, 0 0.0001, you will end up multiplying and adding perhaps numbers that require 10, 12 significant digits, because you have a bunch of zeros, in which case you are trying to save yourself from this error, but you are facing another error now because of the losing of the digits of the computer. So the round of error these days, you know, in the older days, it was a more important problem. You, you used to balance the question. You know, in the, the computer. These days, this is phased uh, only, rarely, only with uh, extremely small, small, extremely and unnecessarily small, let, let, let me see, small h -man. Because you are losing significant digits that are significant for your computation purposes. So, so this says that you should just keep this in mind. I mean, you don't arbitrarily, without thinking at all, choose an H1 of 10 to the minus 8 and say that you, you, know, you have this great computer and you have enough time. So you just say, all right, let's forget about it. Let's just use 10 to the minus 8 and, you know, and let the computer work until you know, tomorrow afternoon so I have enough precision. That doesn't always work that way. This is what this says. You have to analyze, you have to make sure that your numbers are such that the significant digits that you use are handleable by the computer. And that's related to the word size of the computer, right? Yeah. Uh, it is a 32-bit machine or 16-bit. Yeah, it was 16-bit just you know, a few, uh, you know, few, uh, few years ago, right? The first one computer was 16-bit. So it's a 16-bit. You don't have, you know, it's 2 to the 15, right? 
such a huge number. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, can I use double precision and all that? So all these numeric storage features of the computer may become important if you start dealing with what playing with extremely small edge values. Be careful. And in which case, you may get the total error. This is H. This is total error. This is the total numerical error. And this is zero. This suggests that as H increases, the total error increases, right? Well, that's true except for extremely small H values. So you may, so the actual shape may be something like this. You face two different, two other problems. Forget about the errors now. I'm not talking about the errors. The too small H causes, first of all, unnecessarily endless simulations. That's the economic problem. Two, you run out of memory. You have memory problems. Okay? And when you're studying all these variables, and if you start storing zillions of, you require million array sizes, yeah. many variables, then you are facing a memory blow up problem. So that's another issue. So that's why, you know, you are not kind of a, you know, computer billionaire, computer storage billionaire that says, okay, I'm going to run with H with 0 0.0000001 and it's for the other one. That's not that easy. All right, so keep these trade-offs in mind. Beyond that, what do you say? The rule is what? You use a small enough H. How small is small? We'll talk about it later a little bit. It depends on the method. Uh, and how do you analyze it? There is no easy solution. We, we discussed in IE 550, remember? There is a, there is a, uh, uh, I'll talk about it at the very end later. But in general, it's a trial and error method. Okay? You start with a reasonable age, you do with a few experiments, in general you can find, for most models, you can find a safe age value with a few experiments. I'll talk about it later. But, uh, uh, Let me just uh, let me just say a few words about this the this this the, the Taylor series, the Taylor approximation, Taylor extension. Just give you five, six minutes to say a few words about this. Now uh, so this tells us about the basic mechanisms involved, uh, the fact that we, are, we must use small h when we use uh, Euler's method. It's a crude first order approximation. Order of magnitude is h squared for each step and h at the very end accumulated error. So the question is, can we do better? Sometimes it's not very desirable. You know, sometimes this depends, of course, right? depends on what kind of numbers you deal with, right? O of H can be significant if you are dealing with small numbers, right? I mean, if you, the numbers are already what? In two-digit numbers, and H is 0 0.1, you know, 0 0.1 is, is, can be a significant number, right? 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 it can be a significant error if you're doing two-digit numbers only. But if you're dealing with millions, you know, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 are, are negative. It depends on what kind of numbers you deal with. So for that reason, there is a need for, typically, there is a need for more detailed analysis. And later I will also prove to you that other method and some other simple methods can actually give behavior patterns, solution patterns that are actually plain wrong. I'm not talking about the magnitude of the error. I'm talking about the pattern can be wrong. And you know that from IE 550. Remember? With a relatively large age, some models 
especially nonlinear models, may yield results, numerical approximation solutions that are in shape wrong, not numerical quantity of the error, but the patterns are wrong. The patterns can be oscillating, whereas the true pattern may be what? A growth pattern. The true pattern may be a goal seeking to an equilibrium, whereas this may be exponentially exploding or going even to negative infinity. So some crazy, completely unreal pattern can be obtained as a result of these crude methods. So for all these reasons, we have this kind of second heading which says higher order Taylor methods. Higher order. And this is just this is just common sense. Higher order Taylor methods. Now this one Euler's was one, higher order Taylor's method is two. It's just pure common sense. What do you say? What am I going to, you can guess. I'll say what? Let's include two terms, right? You don't have to be genius to figure out that it will be a better method. So write this down. Why pi plus one equals y pi plus hy prime pi plus h squared <coughs> Two factorial. And now plus, what do you have? H cube or three factorial. Now, now I'm truncating after with all the terms after the second Taylor term, the second. Uh, uh, What did I do here? This is second derivative, right? And there is third. After I am omitting everything after second derivative, right? Okay. So it looks like this then. Thus, it has a name. A two-term Taylor method. This is this is now not called anymore Euler's method. It's called a two-term Taylor approximation looks like this. Y0 is given by Y of 0. Y i plus 1 equals Y i plus what? H times, H times, what's this guy? Again, the differential equation is the same, right? What's the differential equation? Y dot equals what? That's the that's We are assuming still about the first order in general, non-linear or in general, homogeneous or non-homogeneous. First of the differential equation. H times, so what am I going to put for this? Ti. Huh? I'm going to use the given known parameters and functions, right? Plus what? This was earlier, right? Now plus I am adding, what's the next term? H squared over two times. Yeah, because this is the second, uh, the second term with respect to time, which means you just take one more derivative, which is F prime. This is it, this is. All right. Okay, so this is correct. This is a name, this is called second two-term, second order Taylor approximation, or two two-term Taylor solution method. Very quick example. What dy over dt final or the same example, which is all right, that is same example. So how does it work? To apply, what do I need to do? Can I apply it immediately? I need 
I need F. Do I have F? This is nothing but what? F. Right? Cy. So I already have F. I have this. I have I choose H. Let's see. I have Y0. Y0 is given. That's given, right? I have Y0. I choose H. So I have Y0. I choose H. I have F. I have H. I need F prime. I need F prime. So that's one thing in this. So what is F prime? F prime T Y equals what? I well, what is it? You take the you took the derivative of this and you got one. Yeah, that's number one trap, right? I always make the same mistake. That's why I'm doing this. I always made the same mistake when I used to and I still can't make that mistake. The derivative, what is this? This is what? D of, of, of dt of this what? Of this function, right? Of f. So of what? Minus y plus t plus 1. I am taking the derivative of this degree, and which is what? But not d of. The derivative of this function with respect to time, the trick is what? There's y prime there. Right? Minus y prime. And then the rest is what? Plus one. That's the one in H. And then minus y prime, is, am I complete? Can I use it now? No, y prime is undefined. I cannot put y prime in here and do it. Now y prime is what? What's minus y prime? Yeah. I go back, it's minus f. Do you agree? Yeah. Y prime, where is it? This is y prime. Minus y prime is minus f, so it's what? And it is y, is this correct? Minus t, minus 1, is this correct? Plus 1. Huh? This is minus y prime, which is equal to finally what? Y minus t. So now I am set. So now I can do it, right? So now, therefore, the equation is like this. Verde. Minus prime minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Minus prime. Plus H minus Y I plus T I plus one plus H square over two times Y I minus T I. Bu kadar. Bunu tutta çizeceğiz. Şey de aynı hikaye. T I eşitme I times H. Doğru mu? Yani birisi aynı. Örneğin şu denklem değişti. Avantajı tam aynı analizi yapsanız hemen to make the long story short gittiği zaman madem bir şey içeri soktunuz h kareyi bunun order of each step hemen yazalım ondan sonra bitirelim burada. bunun bu sefer bunun error Trankation eradan bahsediyoruz. Şimdi bundan bahsetmeyeceğiz artık. Çünkü hep aynı zaten. Bu kompütür kapasiteli bir yeri ve major eradı değil. Major eradı. Trankation eradı ne? Yani trankation eradı. Trankation eradı ne? Each step. At each step. Bütün Omit ettiğin, trakit ettiğin törmleri dominate eden törm H, H cube. Böyle o dominate eden order of H cube olacak şeyi. Trakitin eleri. O order of H cube. Cumulative eleri mi o zaman? Cumulative eleri diyen. Order of H cube. Dolayısıyla 
Bunlar bir ordu o bin şey bin kurumu kendi dengi. Ordu of age square'e ordu of age kesin tercih ederiz. Genel genel olarak da bir detay var. Şimdi önümüzdeki Perşembe günü de şey konuşacağız. Bunun application'ına geldiğiniz zaman bir takım bir Türkçe daha iyi gelecek metot. Yani bu e, bunu apply etmek kolay değil. Şu hesabı yapmanız lazım. Bu hesabı yaparken insan hata yapabiliyor. Yöreniz diye. Yani biraz human faktör var burada. İnsan eli var. Yani kişiye verdiğiniz zaman bunu gördüğünüz zaman kişinin elinde model var. Direkt bilgisayara girebilir mi? Burada modeli alan insanın önce şu derivatif doğru alması lazım. İşte derivatif zordur, hata yapar filan diye bir takım pratik uygulama şeyleri var ve o da bir takım başka yöntemleri sebep olmuyor. Rangi kata diye çok meşhur esas RG rangi kata yöntemleri. Meşhur bir sinematik. En çok kullanılan bir sinematik.